We are privileged tonight to have Dr. Tim Bell with us. Uh, how many times has this been, Tom? I lost the <laughs> <laughs> We usually get him once or twice a year, and uh, so this is one of those lucky nights. So please welcome Dr. Ken Bell. Well, thank you, Jim. That's how I like the introduction, short and sweet, and give me all the time I can get. <laughs> okay. It's good to have you all out tonight. Tonight we're going to be looking at Stephen Hawking's evolutionism, the religion that offers nothing. We'll see <laughs> that uh, what is being passed off as science today really is a religious philosophy masquerading as if it were a scientific fact, and that the uh, logical and scientific arguments they bring to bear to support their alleged science do not hold up under cross-examination. First of all, we have to realize that Stephen Hawking is a force to be reckoned with. He is undoubtedly the most famous scientist in the world today alive. Uh, perhaps the only scientist more famous than him would be Albert Einstein and uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Of course, they have gone on. But Stephen Hawking is still alive despite the odds. When he was diagnosed with ALS in his early 20s, he was told he'd only have two or three years to live. He is now 72. So he has lived 50 years longer than what they expected. Anyway, he uh, is, you know, the poster boy for evolutionism and atheism. He is considered by many to be the most intelligent man in the world today, which is definitely debatable. Uh, and even, <laughs> but uh, be that as it may, he is a media icon. Last year, they had this movie come out, The Theory of Everything, which was a fairly decent biography. He did, in fact, marry a Christian wife. Uh, she, of course, thought he'd be dead within a couple of years. You know, the Bible tells us don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But she thought, well, maybe I can witness to him, maybe he'll get saved. You know, he's only got a couple of years. Well, he's still alive today, 50-some years later. So he is, of course, because of being bound to his wheelchair with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, one of the most easily recognizable scientists. He even says, you know, I can't go anywhere incognito. If I put on a wig and, and sunglasses, it doesn't matter. The wheelchair gives me away every time. <laughs> so he uh, definitely is recognized. Discovery Channel and other uh, science programs have featured him many times. Here we have Stephen Hawking's universe, as if he owns it. Well, he may know a few things about it. He doesn't own it. It's not his universe. <laughs> uh, the other one says Stephen Hawking's grand design, which I find to be oxymoronic since he does not believe in design. And uh, the other one, Stephen Hawking, Master of the Universe. Well, here again, he doesn't know everything there is to know about God's universe. Nobody does except God. So he's hardly the master or the owner of the universe by any means. Nonetheless, as the old, uh, old commercial, this probably dates me a bit, but back in the early 80s, they had a commercial about E.F. Hutton, you know, the financial advisor. And when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Yes. <laughs> Well, unfortunately today, when Stephen Hawking speaks, people listen because he is such an iconic figure and many people think that even his outlandish ideas will someday prove to be true and that we cannot discount anything he says because he's so much more brilliant than any of us. Well, that isn't necessarily so. Now then, Stephen Hawking and many of the most famous evolutionist scientists today are of the materialist mindset. That means that they hold to materialism as science and truth. Now, materialism is not like Madonna, the material girl who likes material goods. It's an all-pervading philosophy, worldview, and religion that basically says the material universe is the whole of reality. There is nothing beyond the physical universe. Space, time, and matter is the whole of reality. There is no spiritual dimension. Therefore, by definition, there can be no spiritual creator, even though the Bible says God is a spirit and he is indeed our creator. So we have to understand that to them, this is so much a cherished belief that it has, become, it has become fact in their mentality. They think if we have the majority of scientists on our side and we all believe it fervently enough, then like the Velveteen Rabbit, it gets loved real. You know, they love it so much it becomes real. <laughs> anyway, so my hat's off to Richard Lewontin, who was very honest in his appraisal of the materialist position, although an evolutionist. He said, our willingness to accept scientific claims 
that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Notice being committed to something with religious fervor and ardor does not, uh, there go, as a logical necessity, make it a fact just because they're committed to it. It's a non sequitur that being committed to something therefore makes it scientific. But in their minds it seems true. Now he admits in the next sentence that that is actually true. He said it is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes. Okay. A priori simply means prior to looking at any evidence, they've already made up their mind about what is true. And therefore, they're going to interpret any evidence they see in light of their a priori commitment. Although having a prior commitment to a belief system doesn't make it true or valid in any logical sense whatsoever. So we're forced by not science, not facts, not evidence, but an a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and set of concepts that produce material explanations. In other words, they've programmed the supercomputers of their minds with the prime directive. You will never explain anything as being requiring supernatural intelligent design. Evolution is always sufficient. Even if it appears impossible, someday we'll find out how it is possible. And creation is simply excluded from the arena of discussion by being labeled an invalid competitor. It is not eligible because they say so. Now, saying it, of course, doesn't make it so. Uh, once Abraham Lincoln was challenged by a uh, heckler in the audience at one of his political stump tours. And this heckler was trying to trip him up and uh, see if he couldn't get the better of Abraham Lincoln. He said, tell me this, Mr. Lincoln. If we call a sheep's tail a leg, how many legs does that sheep have? Well, wisely, Lincoln responded, sir, that sheep has four legs because calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. And if you can get the majority of voters on your side or the majority of authorities and scientists on your side to call the tail a leg, it still doesn't change reality. The sheep still has four legs, not five, because that's fact, that's truth, that's reality, and saying it doesn't make it so. And a lot of scientists today need to realize that logical truth. So he says no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Why? Can they prove that there is no God? Can they set up an experiment and by the scientific method prove there is no God? No. And science, by classical definition, is a search for truth, whatever that truth might be. It's not prejudiced. It's not biased and bigoted. Scientists are, very often, but science itself is not. The scientific method is supposed to be open-minded, searching for truth, whatever that truth might be. And therefore, being open-minded, it would say, maybe there is a creator. Maybe a creator is the best explanation for the origin of the universe and life and man. Maybe materialism is not true. That's revolutionary to say that. You're not allowed to say that today. You can't say, is materialism true? Is evolution true? You can only say, how did evolution happen? You can debate that all you want, but you cannot ask, is it true or not? That's not allowed. That's been ruled inadmissible by their court of pride, prejudice, bigotry, and preconceived ideas. So when they say we cannot allow divine foot in the door, that's their religious prejudice. It takes as much faith, if not more, to believe there is no God than to believe that there is. Even the Supreme Court said so, said non-theistic religions are still religions. A rose by any other name is a rose just the same. So we are often accused as Christians of being very narrow-minded and bigoted. You know, we're so exclusive. You say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. Well, yes, we're simply quoting the one we believe to be the creator incarnate. And his words have infinite authority because of that fact. And if we profess to follow him, how can we discount what he has said? Oh, but it's so narrow-minded, it's so bigoted, it's so exclusive. Well, every truth claim is exclusive. Them saying that we're narrow-minded and bigoted is an exclusive claim. It's excluding us from what they say is the right thing to do. So 
We're not being bigoted and biased any more than anybody else. Every other religion, if you don't agree with what they say, what do they say? You're wrong. Because anyone who says this is true is simultaneously saying anyone who disagrees with this statement is wrong because if it is the truth, then nothing can disagree with it and be correct, obviously, logically. So it's not just us. It's every other religion, including the materialist and atheist religion, who is so biased and bigoted that God can't have any place at all. They can't even prove that he doesn't exist, but he can't have any place. He's not even allowed to be brought up as an alternative explanation for anything because they've made an a priori commitment to materialism, as if that somehow gives it sanctimonious imprimatur of, of scientific truth when it does nothing other than say they choose to believe in a religion. Now, when we look at the dictionary definition of religion in the Random House College Dictionary, I love this because it is so true, it is merely a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. Does materialistic evolutionism fit that dictionary definition? You bet it does. Absolutely. So we have organizations today like the uh, Foundation for Freedom from Religion. I like to say, what are you talking about? Who do you think you're trying to fool? You know, I was born during the day, but I wasn't born yesterday. Your belief that there is no God is a religion and even declared to be so by the dictionary and the Supreme Court. So basically, you're wanting your religion to have special privileges over everybody else's religion that happens to believe in God, but your non-theistic religion is still a religion. So you can't have freedom from religion because any universal philosophy or worldview is by definition a religion. Also, the Supreme Court definition of religion that we have in the Supreme Court case that said a religion need not be based on a belief in the existence of a supreme being. In the 1961 case of Torcaso versus Watkins, the court described secular humanism as a religion. Well, if you look at the Humanist Manifesto, they declare that they are non-theists who believe man evolved according to a continuous process over many millions of years of time. Well, basically, evolutionary materialism. And calling yourself a non-theist doesn't make a nickel's difference between an atheist. You look up the definition, it's the same. They're synonymous. So, when the court said secular humanism is a religion, it declared materialistic evolutionism to be a religion as well, like it or not. Finally, amazingly enough, even Satanism defines religion or evolution as a religion. Now, here I show Roger Morneau, former high-ranking Satanist. You can look up his name on YouTube. He has an amazing testimony of how God saved him out of Satanism. But what he found out from the high-ranking high priests of Satanism about evolution was very revealing. He said, anyone teaching the theory of evolution is considered to be a minister of that great religious system. Notice, not scientific system. You know, the amazing thing to me is that the demons and the devil himself are smarter than some of our most famous scientists. You know, the Bible says that if you believe there is but one God in James, that you do well. But remember, the demons also believe and tremble at the thought. Satan himself didn't even try to deny God's existence. He said, I will exalt my throne. I will be like the Most High. I'll be equal to God. I'll be like him. You can't be like something that doesn't exist. So Satan and the demons are smarter than many of our most famous scientists today. What a tragic thing to consider. They have enough sense to believe in God, but they don't have enough sense to submit to him and follow him. But they certainly don't deny his existence. So the Satanists correctly identify evolutionism as just another false religion. Satan who comes to kill, steal, and destroy doesn't care what false religion you believe, so long as it's a false religion that will lead you to eternal ruin. Because he hates God, and he hates those made in the image of God. You know, God's kind of like Superman. Uh, not much you can do against Superman. He's Superman. But he loves Lois Lane. And you can get to Superman by getting to Lois Lane. And she is vulnerable, isn't she? And we, his bride, his church, are quite vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. Those made in the image of God who are redeemed by the blood of Christ but have to accept that truth. Well, God loves them too. And when they get led astray, it hurts God. And that's what Satan's uh, design is to do, to kill and steal and destroy and get back at God any way he can, especially by trying to get us to believe false religions that will lead to our ultimate doom. So, he says it's just a religion, not a science. Also, he said every teacher of that theory is recognized by the spirits as a person of great value 
and receives a very special unction or anointing from Satan himself, giving great power to induce spiritual blindness. You may wonder, you know, people ask me all the time, how can these scientists who are so smart believe this stuff? Well, it isn't just the mind. There is a spiritual dimension that is very real. And there are beings, both wicked and holy, that fight in that dimension. And when you give yourself over to the way of rebellion, guess what? The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. You're in his domain, and he will blind the minds of them that believe not. You give him access, he'll do it. And once you have that spiritual blindness, it's incredibly hard to come out of. He also said, Satan considers the teachers of the theory of evolution to be so valuable to him that he assigns a retinue of fallen angels to follow that educator all the remainder of his life. Wow, that's pretty important. It must be that this doctrine, this religious doctrine, this false religion of evolution is perhaps the most successful tool in the arsenal of our mortal enemy, Satan. When you think about it, it's so successful, it must be the most successful lie the devil has ever spawned. It's believed by more billions of people, both outside and inside the church, than any other false doctrine in the world. And no wonder he gives a retinue of fallen demonic angels to accompany those who espouse this, especially those who are famous. You know, it always amazed me that Hitler, you know, really was a nobody. He only ra raised to the rank of corporal in World War I. He was a failed artist. You know, he didn't do anything, amount to anything. And yet, when he got into politics and started to gain power, somehow he got endued with some kind of an anointing from somewhere, it certainly wasn't from God, to where he could get up and persuade the minds of millions. I tell you, that wasn't because he was any great man. It was because some fallen angels were following him around and giving him supernatural demonic power. It's the only thing that explains it. And here, he says, it's not just Hitler, it's anybody who Satan can see to be used. They will have that retinue of fallen angels. So, the materialists labor under what I call the definition delusion. They define illegitimately materialism as science and truth, as if saying it makes it so. Saying it does not make it so. You've got to prove it. Also, they assume that God and the supernatural are therefore unscientific and untrue because they've labeled them as such, not because they've proven scientifically that that is correct at all. And that leads to an invalid conclusion, most famously given by Carl Sagan, the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. Really, Dr. Sagan, could you please prove that for me by the scientific method? Could you please uh, show me what experiment uh, can be repeated and tested and always give the same result that God does not exist? You see, he's making a statement that he can't even prove purely on his authority as a famous scientist, purely hoping that people will believe the logical fallacy of argumentum ad authoritarium, that if the authorities say something, it must be true. If the scientists say so, it must be true. Or a like logical fallacy known as argumentum ad populum, an argument addressed to the population of the majority. If the majority agrees this is true, it is therefore true. But of course, you don't have to live long in this world to find out that many times the authorities and the scientists are dead wrong, often with deadly consequences. And many times the majority is wrong. In fact, it's very easy to refute this illogic with a logical, valid syllogism. We start with a valid premise. All humans are fallible. Would anyone disagree with that premise? That means all humans are capable of making mistakes. Yes, you don't have to live long to know that's true. So that's a valid premise to start with. So that's our premise. All humans are fallible. Next, all scientists are human. Logical conclusion. All scientists are fallible. Inescapable logic. And yet they think if they have the majority on their side and they say so pontificating long enough and loud enough, it somehow makes it a fact. That you can call the sheep's tail a leg as much as you want to. The sheep only has four legs, not five. Now, it gets to the extreme where it doesn't matter if all the evidence supports intelligent design and contradicts naturalistic evolution. For example, Dr. Scott Todd, an immunologist at Kansas State University, said in Nature magazine, which is the most prestigious science journal in the world today, he said even if all the data, not just the majority of it, but all of it, every last bit of the data, point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because 
it's not naturalistic. Really? Well, who has proven that naturalism is the whole of reality? Who has proven that there is no supernatural God? Who died and bequeathed to them the authority to change the classical definition of science for a, from a search for truth, whatever that truth might be? Now that means everything is open to debate. Everything is open to be proven or disproven, even materialism and evolutionism. That means we might just be able to say that based on the laws of chemistry and physics and mathematics and experiments, that beyond a reasonable doubt, the overwhelming weight of the evidence shows materialism is not true. And therefore, there's only one other logical possibility, supernatural intelligent creation. Here again, this is based on fundamental logic. You can look it up in a book of logic. It's called The Law of the Excluded Middle. The Logical Law of the Excluded Middle. Does anybody know what that law states? It states if you can show that there are two and only two possibilities to explain a phenomenon. If you can, beyond reasonable doubt, exclude one. The remaining one must logically be true. If there's only two possibilities and you show that one is false, the remaining one has to be true. Now, when it comes to our origin, there are only two possibilities. Either a creator was necessarily involved, at least to some extent, in our origin, or a creator was completely unnecessary because everything can happen by natural, non-supernatural forces. Or to put it very simply, either a creator was involved or a creator was not involved with our origin. Can anybody please tell me a logical third possibility? There is no third possibility. Therefore, if we can show beyond any reasonable doubt, and anybody who's studied this at all knows that we can, that materialism is excluded by the overwhelming weight of the evidence. It is mathematically, physically, chemically, thermodynamically, and experimentally impossible based on everything we do know. They keep appealing to, well, maybe someday we'll find this answer. Well, I'm sorry. Our exclusion of it is based on what we do know, not what we don't know. And you can only hope someday we might find out, but there's no guarantee that we ever will, and there's no doggone expiration date on it. Science is what we can prove in the here and the now, and what we can prove in the here and the now is naturalism does not work. So come back when you have proof instead of just empty promises that maybe someday we'll find out. How can that be scientific fact? How can that be superior to the creationist position that says the most important things in life are information and machines? And nowhere in the history of science have we ever seen information or machines arise except by an intelligent design and control procedure. An intelligent inventor, an engineer for the machine, an intelligent author for the information. We can prove any day of the week in any laboratory. That's a fact, repeatable, testable, observable, a fact by any definition of science. Where's the fact it can happen any other way? I mean, they don't even have parity with us. They can say, well, it can also happen by naturalism. We have the experiments and the laws that prove that. No, they don't even have parity. They have nothing. We have everything. Yet they have the audacity to say, well, we're just going to exclude you by definition because we define what science is and not you other simpletons. Well, basically, that means even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, it can't be accepted because it's been ruled ineligible in the arena of debate as to how we came about, our origin took place. Now, to put this in terms that everybody can understand, every year we have a big football game called the Super Bowl. And the teams with the best record are supposed to fight it out on the gridiron to prove who's the best in the world, at least for that season. So, say we have this historic football game, and two teams show up, and it's very historic, because in this game, one team dominates like never recorded in the annals of the history of the game of football. One team runs up a higher score than has ever been achieved before. One team runs up more positive yardage than has ever been recorded before. But the other team does so poorly that at the end of the game, they not only don't have any data in their favor on the scoreboard, such as points, they do have something that's not in their favor, negative yardage, more than ever recorded in any football game in history. So by every objective standard of measurement, by the data that's supposed to prove who wins and who loses, they have was lost worse than any team in history. And the other team has won more powerfully and more impressively than any team in history. But at the end of the game, these worst losers in history, instead of hanging their heads in shame and shuffling off to the showers in disgust, bearing the stigma of the worst losers in the history of the game, instead, 
They run triumphantly onto the gridiron. They give themselves high fives. They go, ha, we're the world champions. We've triumphed again. Give us our Super Bowl ring. Of course, the crowd begins to boo and hiss. They say, what's wrong with you? Have you no shame? You know, you're the worst losers in history. We're ashamed we rooted for you. Get off the field. You know, they're just uh, disgusting. They say, oh, you people seem to be under the delusion that football games are won or lost by having the data in your favor. Oh, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what the rule book of the football game says and who's eligible and who's not. You see, when nobody was looking and nobody challenged us, we took the rule book of football and we rewrote it. And the first rule we put in the rule book of football is that our team is the only team in the world that will ever be eligible to play the game of football. Other teams might be a lot more talented. Other teams may be able to put a lot more data on the scoreboard in their favor. But it's irrelevant. What matters is eligibility. We're eligible. They're not. We show up on the football field. We win by default. They lose by ineligibility. And that's the end of the story. We win, they lose. Sayonara. We're the Super Bowl champions. That would never be tolerated in any athletic competition. It should not be tolerated in any court of law or any academic debate. And yet the evolutionists think they can just steamroller over us with this idea that naturalism is science and truth because they say so. They can't even prove that statement is true by the scientific method or by logic. So it is not true just because they say so. And as in football, they either better put up or shut up. If you can't put points in your favor, it means something. It means you're wrong. You know, grow up and face reality. Now, the Big Bang. According to the Handy Space Answer Book, 15 to 20 billion years ago, a Big Bang or explosion occurred creating the universe. The universe began as an infinitely dense hot fireball, a scrambling of space and time. Well, the problem with the Big Bang, of course, is that it starts with something and not nothing. All of the equations start with this cosmic egg, which would be, by definition, literally the mother of all black holes. Uh, it has all the black holes and all the stars and galaxies and all the mass and energy in the universe crammed into something they claim is smaller than the size of a proton, a subatomic particle. Takes a lot of faith to believe that, I'll tell you. So, you start with this cosmic egg, but even Stephen Hawking famously proved through what is now called Hawking radiation that even black holes obey the second law of thermodynamics. They leak radiation over time and eventually will dissipate all their free energy and will actually even disappear. And this mother of all black holes should have been the same. So according to the proven science that we know, not theory, not speculation, not wishful thinking, not what people prefer to believe, but based on proven science, as thoroughly proven as we can prove anything. For example, Isaac Asimov said that the classical laws of thermodynamics are the most powerful generalizations that scientists have ever been able to make about the universe. It's as thoroughly proven as science can prove anything. Einstein said that these laws of thermodynamics would never be overthrown by the advance of science. And indeed, that has proven to be true. So what implications do we get from the first and second laws of thermodynamics? Whether the universe is big like it is now, or scrunched down into this mother of all black holes, the singularity, or the cosmic egg, you still have to deal with that problem of losing available free energy according to the second law of thermodynamics. Now the first law of thermodynamics is the law of mass energy conservation. In other words, no matter what kind of uh, changes or transformations take place in the universe, the books always balance. You never have more or less energy in the universe than what you started with. We know now, thanks to Einstein, that hard matter is actually a coalesced form of energy. It's just a different form of energy, so it's really all energy. And energy is under the second law of thermodynamics. Energy degrades. It changes from a usable form called free energy to an unharnessable, unusable form called entropy. Entropy always measures the unavailable energy in a system, unusable energy, or the measure of disorder and disorganization in matter, which again is just another form of energy. So the first law states that matter and energy, the total amount of energy in the universe, doesn't fluctuate up and down. It remains constant. No matter what transformations, what transportations, what changes take place in the universe, you never have less or more matter and energy than what you started with. So this is also said to be the law that states that matter and energy cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed. No matter what happens, it always remains constant. However, the second law says that although the quantity remains a flat line, constant, the quality does not remain constant. The quality degenerates over time. 
in the sense of energy, free energy is dissipated, usually by heat, into a dilute, unharnessable, unusable form of energy that although it's still there, it's useless, cannot be harnessed anymore. So it constantly degrades in the physical sense from order to disorder, in the energy sense from usable energy to unusable entropy. And it's running down irreversibly based on proven scientific law, which means the universe, which now contains a lot of free energy, cannot last in this state forever. It will reach maximum entropy where everything will be dark and cold and no life can exist, no machinery can want, run. There is no available energy to do anything utter black, dark, cold stagnation. But the universe hasn't reached maximum entropy yet. It's heading toward it irreversibly, but it hasn't reached it yet. What does that tell us? The free energy in our universe must have had a beginning. It's irreversibly running down. It's limited, and therefore it will have a finite end, but it hasn't reached it yet. If the universe were infinitely old, guess what? We'd all be dark, dead, and cold. <laughs> the whole universe would be dark, dead, and cold. We haven't reached that yet. Therefore, the universe has only been here for a finite amount of time. So the second law says the universe cannot maintain itself eternally in its state of high free energy. Therefore, free energy had to have had a beginning, but it could not exceed the total amount of energy in the universe because the first law prohibits that. Matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. So the laws of physics, the primary laws, show us the universe did have a beginning. The free energy and complexity here had a beginning, but it could not have created itself according to the first law. Therefore, like it or not, we need something supernatural, something beyond the limitations of space and time and natural law, which is exactly what Jesus claimed to be and exactly what he demonstrated himself to be when he came and split history in two. Now, Stephen Hawking himself admits that in real time the universe has a beginning, which is revolutionary. You know, for thousands of years, almost all pagan philosophers and scientists believed the universe was eternal and that you know, by various different cosmic forms of evolution, that's how we got here. Evolution is not a new idea. You know, the Greek philosophers deal, dealt with it thousands of years ago, and it was soundly refuted by Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. But uh, the idea that what the Bible says is true, there was a definite beginning of space and time and matter. Thanks to Einstein, we know that space and time and matter are so intertwined you can't have one without the other. If free energy had a beginning, so did space and time. It all had a definite beginning, just like it says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and time, of course, also. So, he said almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning. Well, they finally caught up to what the Bible has told us for thousands of years. Thanks to the laws of thermodynamics, thanks to Einstein's equations showing the universe had to have had a definite beginning, almost all scientists believe that. But that puts the universe under the supreme law of science. Anybody know what the supreme law of science is? A law so axiomatic, so self-evident, so absolutely required that without it, the scientific method is not even possible. Well, it's not the first and second laws of thermodynamics. It's not the Newtonian laws of motion or gravitation. It's not the laws of quantum mechanics. It is this law, the law of cause and effect, that states that for every effect, there must be an adequate cause and no effect can be greater than its cause. If this law, which has never broken down, by the way, no known exception to this law, there are theoretical exceptions, but nobody's been able to prove with real science, real experimentation, that that's actually true. So it has no known exception, but uh, basically, this law, if it weren't true, you could not run any experiment and know that what results you got, even if you repeated them for a while, would maintain. Because after all, if it's possible to have effects without causes, how do you know that uh, whatever effect you got in your experiment was there because something popped into existence out of nothing and changed the effect, you see? So there would be no certitude in running experimental science if this law were not true. You throw this law out, you're throwing science out simultaneously. It's that axiomatic or self-evident. Now, this law is so true and so hardwired into our consciousness by our logical creator that even children use it without even thinking about it. For example, if I said, you notice there's a 20-ton bulldozer here in the parking lot. Wasn't there yesterday. How'd it get there? And somebody says, I know how it got there. I didn't see it, but this is my hypothesis. You see that little ant on the sidewalk? Last night, that little ant uh, drug that all the way over here from Costa Mesa. Well, even a child would say, no, 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 that, that, that's an inadequate cause. The ant can't pull a 20-ton bulldozer. 
You know, if you said the bulldozer pushed the ant over here, well, it would be overkill, but it wouldn't violate the law of cause and effect, would it? Bulldozer is more than an adequate cause to push an ant around, but not vice versa. So it's not enough to have just a cause, but it has to have an adequate cause, and you can't have a greater effect than what you possess to give. You can't give more force or more effect than what you are able in yourself to give. You can't give more than what you have, is another way of putting the law of cause and effect. And indeed, one of the greatest scientists of all time, Sir Francis Bacon, who was a Christian man of science, said true knowledge is knowledge by causes. Yes, Jim, that's to remind everybody to turn off their cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now then, using the law of cause and effect, we can again do another logical syllogism where we start with a valid premise and reason through to a valid conclusion. The premise we start with is that everything that had a beginning requires a cause to explain its origin. Okay, is that a valid premise? Yes, it's basically restating the law of cause and effect. So from that we argue that the universe, including time itself, can be shown to have had a beginning, which even Stephen Hawking and Einstein agree with. And secondly, it is unreasonable to believe something could begin to exist without a cause. We therefore logically conclude that the universe requires a cause, and not just any cause, not an inadequate cause, but a cause capable of producing all the matter, the energy, the complexity, not only of space and time, but of living organisms which are exceedingly complex, and man who has unique attributes in this universe, personality, intellect, emotions, free will, the power of abstract thought, the power to think thoughts that were never thought before, to invent things that never existed before, to create works of art that never existed before. If we are made as finite miniature creators in the image of the infinite, unlimited creator, why shouldn't we have such amazing creative capacities? Well, at this point, the evolutionists get a little upset. After all, we're using science and logic to back them into a corner and tell them their position is not logical or scientific. So Richard Dawkins is famous for trying to turn the tables. He says, well, you creationists think you've got us here, but I will simply ask a question. Who made the maker? Who created the creator? Who made God? Now, he thinks he's being profound and has somehow tripped us up, but he hasn't at all. In fact, his question is illogical. It is a self-contradictory, illogical question. His question is akin to asking this question. Tell me, please, to whom is this bachelor married? Does anybody see a problem with that question? See, a bachelor is, by definition, an unmarried man. And to ask, to whom is the unmarried man married, is a logical contradiction. God is, by definition, infinite, transcendent, and eternal. His very name, Yahweh, means the eternal self-existent one. That's the most literal translation out of the Hebrew. The eternal self-existent being, the very essence of existence, more existence than any of us had because he existed before we ever did. And he was the cause of all of our existence. So he is the infinite, eternal essence of existence itself, the I am. Now, interestingly, the law of cause and effect does not have jurisdiction over everything. What, what might be outside of its jurisdiction? Something that has no beginning. The law of cause and effect only has jurisdiction over things that have a beginning. But if you are, by definition, infinite and transcendent beyond the limitations of space and time, then you're simply not under the jurisdiction of the law of cause and effect. Now, there is no law of science or of logic that says something cannot be infinite and eternal. Why? Because you don't really run afoul of the primary law of science, the law of cause and effect, unless you have a beginning without a cause. But if you so transcend the limitations of space and time that you needed no beginning, had no beginning, will have no end, there's no logical fallacy or contradiction of science in that. It's simply that God is outside of the limitations of space and time. So God, as creator of time, is outside of time. Since, therefore, he has no beginning in time, he has always existed, so doesn't need a cause, and simultaneously is not under the jurisdiction of the law of cause and effect. However, Einstein, Stephen Hawking, and most scientists today agree the universe did have a beginning. It is under the law of cause and effect. It requires an adequate cause. Now we've got to ask ourselves a question in light of what we know in the 21st century about the nature of the universe and things in it like human beings. 
what would be an adequate cause, according to the law of cause and effect, to explain everything to the minutest detail that we know in the universe? Well, actually, this question was raised thousands of years ago by Aristotle in refuting the evolutionists of his day. Others who were trying to say everything just kind of came from nothing or the universe was eternal and it created everything. Well, he used this logical argument, which is still valid today. The first cause of endless time must itself be eternal. The Greeks actually used out figuring out with logic that time itself had to have had a beginning. If time were infinite, that means as far as you go into the past, there's no end to the moments of time. As far as you want to go, no end in the past. And if you go in the future, no end to the amount of moments. How then did we arrive at this moment in time? Whether you come from the past or the present, you can never reach this finite moment in time because you'd have to transgress an infinite number of moments to get here. It's very logical. But it also means time had to have had a beginning. And as Einstein said, if time had a beginning, so did space and matter. They're all intertwined. So we have to have something not limited by time, something superseding and transcending time itself. The first cause of endless time must by definition be eternal, infinite, not limited by beginning or end. Something that could bring time into existence but was not bound itself by time. Secondly, we find the first cause of boundless energy must be omnipotent or all-powerful. Also, the first cause of universal interrelationships must be omnipresent or everywhere present. The first cause of supreme complexity must be omniscient or all-knowing. The first cause of consciousness must itself be conscious, since you cannot give that which you do not have. The first cause of natural laws must be a lawgiver. We don't get laws from nothing. We don't get them from natural forces. They are sustained miracles, put there and upheld by the ultimate lawgiver, the Creator himself. And the first cause of moral values must itself be moral. The first cause of spiritual values must itself be spiritual. The first cause of human responsibility must be volitional or have the power of free will. The first cause of human integrity must itself be truthful. The first cause of human love must be loving, and the first cause of life itself must be living. Putting it all together, we find that the nature of the eternal first cause, only cause adequate to explain this universe and life and man, must be a living, loving, truthful, volitional, spiritual, moral, law-giving, conscious, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, eternal cause. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> Just so happens to be the attributes revealed by the God who has revealed himself in the Bible. And it's uniquely true of the Christian God and no other. And we didn't arrive by that by quoting the Bible. We used the supreme law of science, the law of cause and effect. Now, in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, it tells us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. His way is infinite and eternal. We're finite and temporal. But his is so far beyond us that we can't even fathom it. And that's simply telling the truth. It's humbling, but it's true. So, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, some of evolutionists have actually objected and saying, well, if God is so transcendent and infinite and eternal, then he's so far beyond us that it makes him irrelevant. I mean, how can we even relate to a God who so infinitely transcends everything that we are? You know, if, if we have to relate to something we can understand, and God's ununderstandable in the ultimate sense, so it makes him irrelevant, even if he exists. Well, that's pure malarkey, pure hypocrisy. Imagine somebody saying, well, you know, I can't have a relationship with anyone or anything unless I totally understand everything about it or that person or whatever. Nobody can live like that. You know, somebody says, ah, I can't believe in your God because I, I can't totally understand him and therefore I can't have a relationship with him. Okay, well, by that standard, stop living because you can't do anything without somehow depending on things you don't fully understand. For example, this fellow says that and I said, okay, well, he says, well, I'm going to leave now. I've refuted you. Your God is irrelevant. I can't fully understand him, so I can't have a relationship with him. I said, really? Well, I think you're a hypocrite because nobody lives that way. Oh, really? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to call my friend and he's going to pick me up and I'm just going to leave. I said, no, you can't do that. Why? Because you're using uh, an iPhone, and you don't fully understand how your iPhone works, do you? You couldn't build one from scratch. You don't understand all the science behind it. Well, yeah, but I know how to work it, and it works real well if I do what I'm supposed to do. That's all I need to know. Right. You can have a wonderful relationship with your iPhone just by knowing enough. You don't have to know everything. He says, okay, 
I'll put my phone in my pocket and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll walk home. How about that? Got any objections to that? Yeah. You're walking on the earth, my friend. Nobody knows all the secrets of the earth, including you. And since you can't have a relationship with anything or anyone you don't fully understand, you can't walk. Oh, he says, well, I better sit down and think about this. Well, I'm sorry, you can't do that either. Uh, because you'll happen to be using your human mind, and we sure don't know all the mysteries and secrets of the human mind. Therefore, you cannot have a relationship with your mind. Oh, he says, well, I'll just sit down and I'll try to stop thinking. Is that okay? Nope, because you're still breathing. And we still don't know all the mysteries and secrets of human life. So all you can do, my friend, if you don't want to be a hypocrite, is to lay down and die. Because nobody can live the way you say that we have to, as your objection to having a relationship with God. The point is we don't need to know everything, we just need to know enough. As it says in Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, but that which has been revealed belongs to us and our children forever. We know he's real, we know he created us, we know he died for us, we know he loves us and wants to adopt us as his royal family, and as the bride of his son, Jesus Christ, we know he wants to live with us and love us forever. That's all you need to know. How much does a child need to know to realize his mother loves him, his father loves him? He doesn't know everything, but he sure knows that. And that's all that counts. The most beautiful thing in the universe is love. And God's shown us plenty more enough for us to realize that he loves us. Okay. Now, nothing is actually the preferred cause of everything to those who so hate God. The New Testament in the Greek has a name for these people. You know what they're called? Mesotheists, haters of God. Yeah, God doesn't hate them, but for some reason, they hate him. They hate any authority figure, and the ultimate authority figure, of course, is God, from whom all authority rightfully flows. So they say, nothing. If we have to have a cause, then nothing is our cause. <laughs> Really. Now, Alan Guth and Paul Steinhardt, Alan Guth at MIT is very famous for his postulate of the inflationary stage of the Big Bang Theory, and which really hasn't helped them, but supposedly it did. But you notice he says, it is tempting, it's tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Why is it so tempting, especially for a scientist of all things, to say everything came from nothing? Well, it's not tempting scientifically. It goes contrary to everything we know, especially the law of cause and effect. So why is he tempted? Because of his religious philosophy. He has bought into the materialist religion that says God cannot have a foothold at all, no divine foot in the door, no place, nothing. Therefore, he'd rather believe in nothing than to have to believe in God. Edward Tran, a notable evolutionist cosmologist, said that our universe had its physical origin as a quantum fluctuation of some pre-existing true vacuum or state of nothingness. Wow, you know, that almost sounds eloquent if it weren't so absurd. <laughs> you know, nothing is literally no thing. You look up the dictionary definition, nothing is that which does not exist. How can that which has no existence cause anything since there's nothing existing to do any causing? I mean, this isn't rocket scientist. A little child could understand this better than our scientists, I should say. In fact, I like Aristotle's definition of nothing. He said, nothing is what rocks dream about. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think everything came from what rocks dream about, nothing. Now then, Paul Davies, notable evolutionist Australian scientist, he said, this quantum cosmology provides a loophole for the universe to, so to speak, spring into existence from nothing without violating any laws of physics. Not so quick, my friend. We weren't born yesterday. See this ear? This ear is not a trash can. Stop sticking garbage in my ear. It's disrespectful. I won't stand for it. Now, if we started talking turkey with some of these guys, maybe they'd stop spouting such foolishness. I'm not buying it. Show me scientifically. Oh. Well, we're not violating law. Oh, I know a couple of them. You should have learned them in high school. Law of cause and effect, first law of thermodynamics. Aren't those laws? Yes. Well, you said it didn't violate any of them. It violates those. And where are these laws that I can find in the textbook of physics that says something can come from nothing? You know, I'd like to see that law. <laughs> it's not in there. So today we have the high priests of the religion of nothing. 
some of the most famous, iconic, charismatic scientists in the world today, and every one of them has bought into this lie that everything came from nothing. The chief high priest himself, Stephen Hawking. Also, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins, and Paul Davies. They all have had either best-selling books or episodes on Science Channel, History Channel, Discovery Channel, extolling the virtues of believing that everything came from nothing. In fact, uh, Lawrence Krauss had his book, A Universe from Nothing, as a bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list. I guess a lot of people think it's a great idea that everything came from nothing. Yet, if you read his book, you'll find he lies. <laughs> because he gets in there and he admits toward the end, well, we can almost get everything from nothing. Well, it's not quite the same as getting everything from nothing now, is it? You know? But when they interviewed him later in one of these Discovery Channel specials, he claimed boldly, oh yes, we can get everything from nothing, as if saying it makes it so. Well, in his book, in print, he was a little more careful. Now then, here he says, the philosophers in ancient times used to say, how can something arise from nothing? And what's amazing to me is that the laws of physics allow that to happen. Really? Could you point me to the textbook that lists these laws, plural? I don't even know of one. Maybe I'm ignorant, maybe I'm stupid, I don't know. But I think I'm literate, and I think I've studied physics, and I never saw that in the textbook of physics. Now, I watched this Discovery Channel episode very carefully, and he never once said, oh, by the way, those laws I mentioned, here they are, and here's where you can find them in the textbook. He never did it. He did the classical thing. I'm a famous scientist, I understand quantum physics, you're not a physicist, you don't know anything, I say it, that makes it therefore it makes it so does not make it so, sir. And we don't have to be experts. We do require facts, evidence, and logic, instead of you just declaring it so because you're supposedly so smart and infallible when logic says there is no human who is infallible. So have some facts and evidence and logic, please, Mr. Krauss. Well, he never did give it. He just made the authoritative statement hoping nobody would call his bluff. Now, Stephen Hawking, if asked for proof that we can get something from nothing, Lawrence Krauss probably would have used a similar argument to what Stephen Hawking used in this Discovery Channel series, brief series called Curiosity. The first episode in the series was labeled, Did God Create the Universe? And of course, Stephen Hawking emphatically said, no, we found out everything came from nothing. Really? Well, how does that work, Stephen Hawking? He said this, travel right down to the subatomic level and you enter a world where conjuring something out of nothing is possible, at least for a short time. That's because, at this scale, particles such as protons behave according to the laws of nature we call quantum mechanics. In other words, how matter and energy operates at the subatomic or quantum level. Now, I want you to think about this first. Laws describe how matter or energy interacts, okay? It does not describe anywhere where nothing interacts or does anything, because there's nothing there to do any interacting. Hence, there are no laws of nothing. The law of how nothing operates. The law of how nothing does this or that. No, quantum mechanics deals with how matter and energy at the subatomic level operate. But there is no law about nothing. So, he's pulling our leg right there. Then, he says, and they really can appear at random, stick around for a while, and then vanish again to reappear somewhere else. Oh my goodness, we're getting something out of nothing. Then he says, since we know the universe itself was once very small, no, sir, I don't know that. You know, I believe in science where you have to see and test and observe and repeat something to prove it's a fact of science. Did anybody see and test and observe that the universe was once small as a subatomic particle? Got any witnesses here? I haven't met any in my life. And uh, has it been repeated, you know, to prove it's really scientific? No, he says we know something that we cannot know by the scientific method. He implies it's a scientific fact and we can't even prove it by the scientific method. So when he tries to suck you in, oh, we know as if, you know, if you agree with me, you're really smart because I'm so smart. No, we don't know it, sir. Please prove it. He can't. Nobody can. So he says, since we supposedly know the universe itself was once very small, smaller than a proton, in fact, this means something quite remarkable. What could it mean? It means the universe itself, in all its mind-boggling vastness and complexity, can simply have popped into existence without violating the known laws of nature. Wait a minute, you lost me somewhere. Wait, 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 wait a minute. 
there's a couple of big fallacies here. Number one is the fallacy of over-extrapolating a limited observation, okay? In other words, something that can happen on a very small scale does not logically follow. It's a non sequitur of logic to assume that it can therefore happen on a very large scale. For example, if we have a candlestick up here, and we have a young boy named Jack, and I say, Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. Jack, jump over the candlestick. And if Jack is a normal, healthy boy, he can jump over the candlestick back and forth. Oh, well, there you have it, my friends. Because Jack can jump over the candlestick on such a small scale, it is scientific to believe that he now can jump to the moon in a single bound. <laughs> Even a child would say, that's absurd. But that's the same type of argument he's using here. Even if it were true that a proton could appear out of nothing, which it is not true, but even if it were, does that mean all the protons, electrons, and neutrons, and all the mass of the entire universe could appear out of nothing too? That Jack can jump to the moon because he can jump over a candlestick? No, it's a fallacy of over-extrapolation. But even worse than that, we can explain this phenomenon through what we know from Albert Einstein. What's Albert Einstein's most famous equation? E equals mc squared, which means what? E is the symbol for energy. Energy equals mass or matter. Ah, mass and energy are equivalent. Mass and energy are different forms of the same thing. And that means something. That means that energy equals matter times the speed of light squared. So energy equals mass. How much energy is in mass? Well, you multiply it by a very, very big number, 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers per second, times that big number again. That's a very big number. That then, dealing with the amount of mass you have, tells you how much energy is coalesced in the matter. It's a lot of energy. And we, of course, with nuclear weapons, we get a glimpse of just how much energy really is there. But it also means this. It means that matter can be converted into energy, and energy can be converted into matter. Ah, now, this is known physics. This is accepted physics. We don't need your wild, you know, mind-boggling, extravagant explanation, Dr. Doc, uh, Dr. Hawking, that matter is appearing out of nothing at all. There's energy in the system at the subatomic level. And you can simply have a proton coalesce out of the available energy into a different form and then go back to the same form of energy. For example, what's this dangling at the end of my wrist? Not a trick question. It's a hand, okay? So this hand is not nothing. This hand is something. But this something called my hand can exist in two different forms. It can exist in this form. Outstretched fingers, wiggly, <laughs> say that's the form of normal energy. But it can also transform into this form, a fist. A fist is just a hand in a different form. And it can hang around for a while in this form, and then it can transform back into this form. All the while, it's not coming or going from nothing. It's simply something that's already there, changing from one form of the same thing into another form. There's always a hand there in one form or another. And that's all we have here. The most simple, straightforward explanation based on known physics without the exotic explanation that, my gosh, it's coming out of nothing, is that at the quantum level, available energy can coalesce into a proton, hang around for a while, and then transform back into energy. Now, to prove his point, they'd have to run an experiment where there's no energy, not even the elusive zero-point energy that we can't seem to get rid of no matter what we do. There's no energy available, and it still happens. Have they done that experiment? No. My gosh, then they wouldn't have a straw to clutch at, would they? And it's not even conceivable that we really could run such an experiment and guarantee that we've limited all possible forms of energy in the system. So it's not proven anything. We can easily explain it based on known physics. He is just taking advantage of people's ignorance and people's willingness to trust him because he's a famous scientist. He's a charlatan. Hate to say it, but the facts speak for themselves. Now, Richard Dawkins says the fact that life evolved out of nearly nothing some 10 billion years after the universe evolved literally out of nothing is a fact so staggering that I would be mad to attempt words to do it justice. Please, Dr. Dawkins, please indulge in some madness because I would really love to hear the explanation. I don't want to hear this excuse 
that, you know, I'd be mad to attempt it, go ahead and indulge in some madness. I really want to hear the science, the observation, the experiments. Real science, sir, that what you say is true. No, it's your materialistic, God-hating, atheistic religion speaking as if it were scientific fact. See this here? Not a trash can for you either, Richard Dawkins. Knock it off. Okay, Stephen Hawking again says, the laws of evolution, could you list them, please? The laws of evolution supposedly can also determine the initial state. The universe can spontaneously create itself out of nothing. A child could refute this. Nothing can create itself. Why? Because before it existed, there wasn't anything there existing to create itself. Okay? Anybody see a flaw in that logic? I mean, just him saying it as a famous scientist does not make it so. Then he says an amazing thing. If you didn't buy his proton argument, and you shouldn't, he gives another argument. Because there is a law such as gravity of all things, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. This has so many fallacies, it's mind-boggling. He says we can get everything from nothing. Really, sir, is gravity nothing? If you think so, prove it. Jump off the Empire State Building and say, ah, there's nothing can harm me. After all, gravity's nothing. <laughs> no, it's invisible, but it has the power to kill you if you disrespect it. Very real. Furthermore, this real thing called gravity, which is not nothing, cannot exist unless you have something else also existing. What is it? Mass. And then you have a law that dictates how this gravity operates through mass. And, you know, laws tell us how that operates. Okay, God put those laws there. So to get something from nothing, you must first have mass and gravity and the laws that govern how gravity works. You have to have three things in order to get everything from nothing. I think maybe he's given us a little uh, violation of the law of truth in advertising. If he's going to say we're going to get it all from nothing, why do we have to have three things to get everything from nothing? Because we have to have three things to get something. Mass, gravity, and the law that governs gravity. Well, doesn't make sense to me. He also now admits the real truth. There have been various ideas, but for me, the most attractive, what I like, my philosophy, what I prefer to believe, what's attractive to me, by golly, is that the universe was spontaneously created out of absolutely nothing. Well, you know what? We have a First Amendment, Stephen Hawking. You can believe any cockamamie thing you want, and it's actually legal under the First Amendment, but you don't have the right to call it science and truth unless you can prove it. And you sure haven't proved it. Never. It may be attractive to you, but that doesn't make it fact. Then he says, there is a fundamental difference between religion, which is based on authority, and science, which is based on observation and reason. Now give me a break. This joker just said everything came from nothing because he says so and he can't give a single logical or scientifically testable idea to prove that what he said is true. He based it really on nothing but his authority as a famous scientist and then he has the hypocrisy to turn around, yeah, you people believe in the Bible, the authority of the Bible, and we believe in observation and reason. Well, maybe you could give us some observation and reason to back up what you're saying. You certainly haven't done it yet. And you're doing it exactly, the pot calling the kettle black, you're doing it totally on your authority as a famous scientist, and you don't have any observation or reason that's credible to back it up. So, stop being a hypocrite. Now, this is really clear in this video by Ray Comfort, Evolution and God. How many of you have seen this, by the way? Okay, maybe you ought to show it here sometime, Jim. Pretty, very interesting. Ray Comfort goes right to the secular universities and interviews, you know, science students. Just give me one all-fire fact, you know, evolution is such a, you know, proven fact. What's the most powerful fact that absolutely proves evolution is true? What's the one fact that proves it's true? Well, they'd stumble and mumble, they couldn't think of anything. And uh, what they did say, he easily refuted, and they couldn't refute what he said. So, basically, they fell back on authority. Well, we're just students, you know, but our professors, they're authorities, they know it. So, Rafe Comfort said, fine. And he went to some of the top university professors. They stumbled and mumbled as bad, if not worse, than the students. But you know what? If they were asked, why do you believe it, if you can't give a good answer, oh, well, the top authorities, the top scientists, the majority of them, 
the old argumentum ad populum fallacy. The majority of scientists believe it, therefore it must be true. And the most expert scientists like Stephen Hawking and Lawrence Krauss and Neil deGrasse Tyson, they believe it. Here again, we have seen this proves nothing. It is illogical. It is not a valid argument, and it has no real science behind it. Now, in the Discovery Channel series, How the Universe Works, they said this. It's one of the biggest hurdles to understanding the Big Bang. First, you have to buy into the premise that something was created out of nothing. Notice, you don't get to abstain. Sorry, I'd rather abstain. I'll believe the Big Bang, but I want to abstain on this everything coming from nothing. Uh, I, I'd rather take a rain check. Uh, I, I don't really want to buy into that part of it. No, you have to buy into the premise that everything was created out of nothing. And if you don't buy into that, you're rejecting the Big Bang as it's formulated today. You're a fundamentalist, wacko, long in the backwoods, ignorant, you know, uh, just a, a, a... Yeah, yeah, the FEMA camp for you. You're going to get re-educated. <laughs> anyway, uh, I shouldn't even joke about that because that, oh boy, it'd come a lot faster than most people think. Anyway, so you have to buy into it, like it or not, that the greatest axiom of science, the law of cause and effect, is no longer true, and that the second law or first law of thermodynamics is not true either. Then it says, understanding how nothing turned into something may be the greatest mystery of our universe. Boy, I'll agree with that. <laughs> That's one thing I can say tonight I absolutely agree with. <laughs> it's a great mystery. It says, but if you understand that, boy, you're smart. You start to understand the Big Bang. You know, it's almost like the emperor's clothes, you know. If you're a person of, of virtue and honor and goodness, you can see the emperor is clothed with beautiful clothing. But if you think he's naked, you're wicked and vile and awful. Well, a lot of people were saying, oh, I see his beautiful clothes, because if they didn't, it was self-incriminating. I'm a wicked, horrible person if I don't see his magical clothes. And this is the same type of thing, you know. But boy, if you want to be smart and respected, say you believe everything came from nothing in the Big Bang. That's all you have to do. And a lot of people are doing it. Get on the bandwagon. Well, I'm sorry. I will never understand this. It says you have to, you could, then you understand the Big Bang. I'll never understand the Big Bang. Because it starts with the most fatal of all flaws. It requires that we believe everything came from nothing. And there's nothing more illogical or anti-scientific than that. There's no, uh, there's no more inadequate cause than that which does not exist, to put it in a nutshell. So then they simply say it as if saying it makes it so at the end. At the dawn of time, the universe explodes into existence from absolutely nothing into everything. Because if we say it, that makes it so. The sheep's tail is a leg, and a sheep has five legs, because we say so, and we're the majority, and we agree. And how many people don't even know basic logic, basic uh, tenets of debate? You know, I remember when I was in high school, logic was a required course. Debate was a required course. You learned to think critically. You just didn't accept anybody, the teacher, anybody. If they had a logical fallacy, you nailed them, and you were encouraged to do so. We're not encouraged anymore. Because if we did, our politicians <laughs> and many of our scientists would get the boot, wouldn't they? Now, I'm not saying the politicians lie all the time, okay? <laughs> they don't lie all the time. It's just when their lips are moving, okay? <laughs> okay. Now, New Scientist magazine put it this way. Why does the universe exist at all? Why is there something rather than nothing? Perhaps the Big Bang was just nothingness doing what comes naturally. <laughs> I guess if you say a funny, trite statement, we can ignore all the lack of scientific proof and logic and just laugh and believe it anyway, but I can't. Now, Paul Davies, in his book, The Edge of Infinity, he said the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws. The sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle. Well, I'll, I'll grant you that. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a greater miracle than anything I have to believe in in the Bible. I have enough faith to believe any of the miracles in the Bible compared to this one. This one I don't have enough faith for. Now, again, fallacy upon fallacy. He says we have to have an abrupt flash of lawlessness, and, and he calls it the suspension of physical laws. Okay, so physical laws were there, but now something suspends those laws to allow things that are unlawful to happen. 
Well, if the laws are there, the laws are something. They're immaterial, but they're real. So we're not getting everything from nothing if there's laws already there, and then there's something there that has to suspend them. That's something, too. So how do we get everything from nothing when we start with laws that are something, and then something has to intervene to suspend them, and then we get everything from nothing because they've somehow been suspended by something that's there, but it's really nothing? And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, I shouldn't say some of these things. Anyway, um, so thirdly, notice the contradiction. Our great guru, Stephen Hawking, he says, because there is a law like gravity, we can get everything from nothing. Here, Paul Davies, very famous scientist, says, no, we have to get rid of the laws. Then we can get everything from nothing. Which authority are we supposed to believe? They blatantly contradict one another. One says you have to have a law to get everything from nothing. The other says we have to suspend and get rid of the laws to get everything from nothing. And yet they're supposed to all have equal authority and be so much smarter than us. Logical fallacy upon logical fallacy. What I'd like to ask is this. Why is this more scientific than in the beginning God created? It is not. Because in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth is fully in accord with the most axiomatic, the most important, the most sacred law in all of science, the law of cause and effect, which states that if you have an adequate cause, you can get an adequate effect. God adequately explains everything from the tiniest detail to the most majestic and magnificent grandeur in the size of the cosmos. He explains it all. So it is scientific to believe Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created us fully in accord with the law of cause and effect because we have an adequate, omniscient, omnipotent creator to do it. And he showed up in space and time and showed us who he was and demonstrated his power and rose from the dead. That's pretty good credentials. So. It's not more scientific than in the beginning God created because what they believe violates the, the law of cause and effect. Genesis 1-1 does not. It's fully in accord with the law of cause and effect, the axiomatic law of all science. Now, I have trouble with this because, you know, I can believe things like a magician, an illusionist can pull off the illusion of pulling a rabbit out of a hat. But these jokers have pulled the whole universe out of their hat and they don't even have a hat. Well, it's a little bit hard to believe. In conclusion, we find that something eternal must have caused the space-time-matter continuum of this universe to come into existence. There are two options to choose from. An eternal, omnipotent creator, an adequate cause to explain everything, a cause who showed up in space and time and gave us its identity, fulfilling prophecy, doing miracles only the creator could do, and rising from the dead as the ultimate proof that he is Lord of life. Or, there is the other option, eternal, impotent, nothing. And there's nothing more impotent than that which does not exist. So take your choice. Tragically, Stephen uh, Hawking and so many others have chosen this and tried to defend it unsuccessfully, to put it mildly. In conclusion, I quote here Stephen Hawking out of this Discovery Channel episode. He said, it's my view that the simplest explanation is there is no God. No one created the universe and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization. There is probably no heaven and no afterlife either. Well, thank you. You know, what about 90% plus of the people who believe there is some kind of an afterlife? There's some hope beyond the grave. Oh, no, science takes away that hope. This miserable world, there's not anything better, no happy hunting ground, no afterlife, no Christian heaven, no nothing. You die, that's it. You rot back in a plant fertilizer. That's the end of you for eternity. You'll never remember you ever existed. You'll remember, never remember you ever achieved anything. You know, right after this, he says, I am grateful that I had, you know, basically the profound honor of contemplating the universe during my brief stay here. Really? What are you grateful for? You're never going to remember you ever contemplated the universe when you're dead and rotted in a plant fertilizer. You're never going to remember you ever achieved anything. And when everybody else goes extinct, as they will according to the law of evolution, they'll never remember you ever existed or were famous or did anything. So let me ask you a question, according to your own religion. What value did your life have? Why did you exist? What is the difference with you not having ever existed, since neither you nor anyone else will ever remember you ever did or achieved anything? 
you might as well have never existed. And you think, oh, I'm just so glad I was able to exist and uh, contemplate the cosmos. Why are you grateful? You're never going to remember it. You say, you and nobody else has any hope. You know, I would not want to believe that and somebody had over unless somebody had overwhelming scientific and logical proof to force me to that philosophy of despair and hopelessness and worthlessness. God says he has put eternity in our hearts. We know that we know that we know in our hearts that although we had a beginning, we will have no end. We are everlasting beings and we will exist somewhere for eternity. Very profound, much more profound realization than what he's talking about here. So without this overwhelming proof, who would want to believe this? And yet people don't even realize he has no proof. He has bluff and bluster. He has authoritarian and uh, argumentum ad populum logical fallacies. But he has taken the hope away from millions who have dared to believe his word is truth. And for what? You know, of all people in the world, he should want there to be an afterlife, especially the Christian afterlife, where there's a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain, no more tears, no more curse, no more death, for the former things are passed away. Eternal life where everybody loves each other. No war, no crimes, no rape, no robbery. Peace and harmony and love between man and God for eternity, and there'll be no end. Boy, I want that. If there's any chance that that is true, I'd rather believe that. Unless there's overwhelming proof to the contrary, I'm going to believe that. Whether you like it or not, Stephen Hawking. You know, he is such a sad person. You know, he was married to a Christian woman. And in her autobiography of her life with Stephen Hawking, she said at one time, she challenged him. She said, Stephen, why can't you just stand up, figuratively, <laughs> Why can't you just stand up and tell the world, I believe in God? Is that so hard to do? And he said, oh, what would my friends and my professional scientific colleagues think of me if I made such a horrible statement? Oh, I, I would lose all my credibility. I'd lose my friends. I just could never do that. Well, as Jesus said of the Pharisees, they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And they got their reward. It was temporal. They got the praise of men for what it was worth. Not worth much now that they've gotten their eternal reward. So he is a tragic figure. He is sadly deceived. He's a brilliant mind. He's a lot more knowledgeable in science and physics than I could ever dream of being. But at least I have more common sense. At least I'm not blinded by a false religion. So pray for this man. You know, he surely doesn't have much time left. And like the thief on the cross, boy, you can make it right under the wire if you have to. Right in the process of dying, you can call out and say, Lord, remember me. Forgive me. It's all it takes. I pray he'll come to that position. Rather than Stephen Hawking, I would rather put my trust in an inescapable logical argument given by one of the greatest scientists of all time, Blaise Pascal. He is recognized as one of the greatest late Renaissance philosophers and mathematicians. He is recognized as the father of the science of hydrostatics and a contributing founder of the science of hydrodynamics. He also was a pioneer of probability mathematics. Now, in the 1600s in France, there was kind of a resurgence of atheism, and he had a lot of atheist friends. You know, we all should have some atheist friends if, if they can put up with us at all. <laughs> and uh, his atheist friends loved to gamble. I was like, you know, if you don't believe in God, you've got to have some entertainment. You know, they love to gamble. And when they found out that he was working on calculating for the first time mathematically the odds of chance events taking place, they said, oh, Blaze, our good friend, uh, tell us with your mathematical analysis which of these casino games uh, we should play to have the odds in our favor and to win the most. He said, I'll tell you the truth, my friends, the best way to win is not to play. Because these uh, casinos and houses of gambling don't know about my laws of probability I'm developing, but they do know from experience what games favor the house and what games favor the gambler, and they have already chosen the games that do not favor you. So you might win now and then, but the longer you play, the more the odds are against you, the more you're going to lose big time. But he said, why do you even care about the temporal reward of some money that you win gambling? According to your own religious philosophy, when you die, you'll never remember that you ever won anything or even existed. He said, isn't the greatest gamble whether or not we can make a choice that will determine our fate beyond the grave? He said, isn't that the most important wager that any human being can make? 
and thus he formulated the famous wager known as Pascal's Wager, which basically states, how can anyone lose who chooses to become a Christian? If when he dies, there turns out to be no God, and his faith was in vain, he has lost nothing. In fact, he has been happier in life than his non-believing friends. If, however, there is a God, and heaven and hell, then he has gained heaven, and his skeptical friends will have lost everything in hell. This logic really is inescapable, and he's basically basing it on their own philosophical belief. He says, according to your own belief, you have guaranteed a lose-lose proposition for you. If you're right, when you die, you lose everything, including the memory that you ever existed or achieved anything. That's about as big a loss as anybody could suffer, and that's if you're right. But oh, if you're wrong, and there is a God who loved you and created you and wooed you and you resisted and rejected him, then you will get the essence of hell, which is eternal separation from God, who is the source of everything that's beautiful and loving and kind and wonderful. And when the source is rejected, everything good goes with him. You'll be imprisoned forever in a place without God, the essence of hell, no source of anything that's good. He said, you guarantee a lose if you're right, and you lose worse if you're wrong. Right or wrong, you lose or you lose worse. He says, if you put your faith in Christ, if, you, if you're wrong, you don't lose anything any more than anybody else would. You don't get some big penalty. You don't really lose anything if you're wrong. But if you're right and his promise is true, you gain everything the human heart would ever enjoy for all eternity. Why guarantee a lose-lose proposition by putting your wager on that type of faith when you could put your faith in Christ and have nothing to lose but everything to gain if you're right? The logic is inescapable. And there's good reason to believe that what Jesus said is true. He did come in fulfillment of prophecy. He did the miracles only the Creator could do. He rose from the dead. And his prophecies are still being fulfilled today. He will soon return. And then there won't be any more debate about whether or not he exists. Unfortunately, it will be too late for those who have rejected him. So if you have not taken Pascal's wager to heart, I hope you will tonight. Put your faith in Christ. Make that the wager of your life. You have nothing to lose, but everything to gain. Thank you for your attention tonight. Jim, I'll turn it over to you.